Hey everybody, it's David. Today I'm going to be answering some of the questions that you posted, both on my Where Are the Exomoons video and also the Eater Earth video. So I'm combining two videos into one and answering both sets of questions in this one video. So I'm going to kick it off with the Exomoon side, and I have a question here from Arjun who asked, Less than one in six doesn't sound that bad, is it? It could be worse. Is there already a scientific paper about the study of the 60 exoplanets? I agree, one in six is not that bad. I mean, given that there are something like a hundred billion planets in the Milky Way, if up to one in six of them, 16%, can have Earth-like moons, there's a hell of a lot of exomoons out there for us to live on. Actually, the results so far are pretty consistent with our expectation about how big moons might form. And one of the most easy ways to do that is through a capture or through an impact. So if you try to build the Earth-Moon system on a computer using lots of simulations, you find that in about 1 in 5 cases, 20% of cases, you can build an Earth-Moon system through a giant impact. Now for comparison, our current upper limit on Earth-Moon mass ratio objects in the Kepler data is about 33%. So therefore it's completely compatible with our theoretical expectation of how common these events should occur. Okay, so next exomoon question, Stephen asks, Robin Cannett and others say that there should not be Earth-sized moons. So just some background for those of you who don't know who Robin Cannett is, she's a theoretical physicist based at the Southwest Research Institute, where she's trying to simulate moon building events on her computer. So I'll answer that in two ways. First of all, in general, relying too much on theory can be a bad idea. No one expected that hot Jupiters would exist around other stars, and yet we found lots and lots of hot Jupiters. So, sometimes trusting theorists too much for observers can be a bad idea. Secondly, I think the paper that Stephen's referring to by Robin Cannett was actually talking about moons which were formed as regular satellites. So very briefly, there are two classes of satellites, the regulars and the irregulars. Regulars are things which basically formed from the leftover material that built that planet, such as the Galilean satellites around Jupiter. Irregular satellites are basically a catch-all phrase to say that the moon formed some other way. So, for example, by a capture or an impact. And the moon around the Earth is a good example of that. So whilst you can't build Earth-sized regular satellites, it turns out there really aren't any hard and fast rules for irregular satellites. So the game is on to hunt for Earth-sized moons formed that way. So I'm going to switch gears now and switch to a couple of questions that I got on my Eat to Earth video. So first up, Ron Smith on Centauri Dreams asked, I just watched this video and was confused by the statement that the primary Kepler mission has failed to find any Earth analogues. My understanding was that only a fraction of planets detected by Kepler have been confirmed and there are still over a thousand Kepler planetary candidates awaiting confirmation. And Andrew LePage follows that up saying that stating that the primary Kepler mission has failed to find any Earth analogues is premature since the detailed analysis of the data from the Kepler's primary mission is still underway. So I think it's fair to say that we have detected the vast majority of all of the Kepler planetary candidates that we ever will. So perhaps I should have been a little bit more accurate in my language and said that we haven't confirmed an Earth analog yet. Yet. It is possible that we will confirm one of these planetary candidates to be an Earth analog. However, I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical about that. So apart from the fact that we already know about the vast majority of the planetary candidates already, the other reason why I'm a little bit skeptical about this relates to stellar activity. So a few years back, Kepler was coming up for funding for its extended mission, and the Kepler team made this very coherent pitch that they really required several more years of Kepler data in order to be able to overcome the stellar activity, which was impeding their ability to detect Earth-sized planets. Now obviously it was a great pitch because it was accepted by NASA and Kepler was extended. However, the extended mission was cut short when a second reaction wheel failed on Kepler. That means that rather than getting the six years of Kepler data that we'd hoped for, we were cut short at 4.35 years. And obviously that's going to affect our ability to detect really small Earth-sized planets. So thank you so much for these questions. They're always a ton of fun for me to do. And hopefully we're making science feel more like a dialogue and less like a lecture. So look out for a couple more videos from the Cords Laboratory in the next week or two, in particular one from my graduate student Alex Tichy, who is going to tell you about an awesome piece of new research that we've got coming out. So to make sure you get that and all the other news and videos from the Cords Laboratory, click the subscribe button below. Please share this video with your friends. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and stay curious.